Hey, I'm Tim Barnes, and this is the best of You Are the Genre. First I got your voicemail, then I got you. But we can meet in person or maybe on Zoom. So tell me what your genre, tell me what do you do? I'd like to know the things that specifically make you you. Yes, I'm your host, Tim Barnes. You just heard the lovely You Are the Genre intro from my friend, Freddie Nunez. And in this episode, we're going to be covering some highlights that all have to do with animation. But first, I want to apologize for some of the delay you've noticed, even with the release of these Best Of episodes. It's been a busy few weeks for me. It's been a busy month <laughs> in a lot of ways. I, I was just in LA working on an exciting project that you'll learn more about, I'm sure, next year. And on top of that, I was dealing with, you know, a, a little bit of uh, mourning. Just about a week ago, I attended the funeral of my granny, my mother's mother. And it's always important to put certain things on pause and allow yourself to have the space to go through whatever you have to go through to keep your sanity and also keep uh, the memories of the people that you love alive and thriving in your heart. Uh, but that has nothing to do with the bulk <laughs> of the highlights you're going to hear in this episode. I just think, I don't know, is it good when you hear some of these personal insights from me? Uh, I tend to like that. You know, I've learned to love the the WTF with Mark Maron intro. That was my attempt at that. But as you all know, the three questions that I ask in the show are, what is the first genre that called out to you as a child? What was the first official craft that you pursued? And how do you feel about that first craft now? It's something that I ask my guests because I believe they kickstart a thorough investigation of what you want to do as a creative person and how you can focus on that and separate what you do from all the noise trying to define it for you. And animation has come up quite a bit in some of these conversations. One of the first people to bring up animation on this show is my friend James III. He's a talented comedian, actor, and television writer. Oh, oh, and he also has a series of comic books. He has his own comic book company called Rule of Three. But of course, before he started doing all of those things, he was just a kid who loved cartoons. I mean, I when you first sent me that we would be talking about this, I like had a panic attack and I was like, well, what was it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it was. And I think, I mean, if I said cartoons, would that count or would I need to say like these specific kinds of like, <laughs> do I need to say like slapstick, you know, like, you know, uh, Looney Tunes kind of like slapstick animation was the first <laughs> genre okay. that I was. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I mean, well, let's start with the abstract. So it seems like you wanted to just say cartoons. What is it about cartoons? For me, I mean, and, and it's probably a, one of those things that it is like, yeah, like what, why kids love cartoons. But I loved just how boundless they seemed and how there was like both a uh, logic that was illogical, you know, like it would be like Bugs Bunny can walk across the thing or the, they can walk across the thing. But if they look down, then they're going to fall, you know, like those things I loved. And, and when I think about the first thing I've drawn to, this is probably later. I remember loving like Cartoon Network and the kind of like implication that like they, they would have these like interstitials where you were like walking through the office and like Wiley Coyote is at the water cooler. And then over here is Johnny <laughs> Bravo. And then over there is, and they're like in the office. And I was uh. f floored by that idea. And which again, I think is later than like probably the first time I was really into something or anything. But like, I remember that, like when I think about like being drawn to something, you know, like unable to kind of pull myself away from it, that I was like obsessed. And it feels like the interstitials are the thing. And I worry that that's something that like kids don't get now in the streaming world. Yeah. <laughs> but when I think about Nickelodeon or like anything that I loved as a kid, which was very TV based, it is all commercials and interstitials. And it's right. not even necessarily the show. It's just like the tone setting of these like quick things. That's it's the indoctrinated, you're, we're indoctrinated in those moments. Like in those moments is when they're like, <laughs> is when we're getting brainwashed, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's cause I, the thing I named was like being in the office at Cartoon Network, but it's with the cartoons and it's like, yeah, like that was being welcomed 
behind the veil, but there is no, that's a fake thing, you know, like it's a, <laughs> it's a fake idea that you can go to an office and like dap Marvin the Martian, you know, like it's not a real thing that can happen, but it was how they pulled me in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And there used to like, I'm trying to think of things that aren't even cartoons, but like the mad TV thing of you are watching mad tv mad yeah that's all i think about when that <laughs> yeah. comes up right. it's not a specific yeah. sketch or anything it's just that uh. <laughs> right that ear it's it just in your brain and and yeah oh this their stamp they put a stamp in our brains yeah it feels like this is an official thing uh so what was your favorite cartoon uh among those you, you mentioned uh like Bugs Bunny and stuff. Yeah, I did say Bugs Bunny, didn't I? Um, <laughs> when I think about <laughs> my favorite cartoon, <laughs> it's like it probably wasn't even. Well, so so when I also think about this, I used to do impressions. And my first impressions bit, it was Bugs Bunny. And then it was like Foghorn Leghorn and the Chicken Hawk. And then it was like the Genie and Iago in Aladdin. So I feel like I can't think of one specific favorite cartoon but i think those the disney movies and i think the like constant reruns of like warner brothers looney tunes merry melodies those were the jam you know but i never remember there being like one that i was like oh but this is the you know this is the one like even thinking about like probably a disney movie that i watched a lot like rescuers down under i watched that all the time but i would never say <laughs> like that's me like breaking open my memory to find something, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. but I, I remember watching that all the time, but I don't think I ever was like, you know, my favorite one is rescuers down, at, you know, <laughs> well, it's like, it's interesting because you mentioning all this stuff, I can see how that plays out in your comedy as a monotone guy who can't do act outs. I am ever <laughs> fascinated by uh, people like you who can break into character. And I, I, actually, I feel like I rely on people like you, like in a writer's room or any scenario. Um, when you say you can't do act outs, what do you mean by that? I mean, it's, you mean if I you... were to attempt to do, to do an act out, it would be the most uncomfortable moment for both myself and any <laughs> audience member. I mean that... <laughs> I mean, you know how... People pretend that they want introverts to be extroverted, but no one really wants to see the attempt. I think that's, uh... <laughs> yeah, that is an area of like, it's like, well, do you know what you're getting into when you ask me this? Me, this, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. this other, you don't want us to go down this road. You think you do, but you, oh, but if we, yeah, yeah. Okay, I yeah. hear you. Yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know what to do with my legs, uh, but James, you know how to dance. You know how to become, uh, you know how to become Cat Williams. Listen, um, and, uh, <laughs> is a part of that your that, that sort of like open improvisational embodying different people who aren't necessarily yourself? Does that come from cartoons in some way? Do you think? I guess so. I mean, I, I, yeah, like I guess like even just thinking about how throughout any given particularly the Looney Tunes uh, or like Freakazoid, I guess is, or, or yeah, Freakazoid or Animaniacs, I guess like where it's like any of those, there's their baseline, but then throughout they're just like, and now for this moment, I'm, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm Groucho Marx or whatever <laughs> Bugs Bunny would do. Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I guess so. I don't know. I don't, I, I can't say yes for sure, but yeah, probably there's probably a lot of like influence from, that yeah because when we were at all that i was like thank god there's another black guy here and he can do act outs because if everyone was relying on me to do, <laughs> to do that, i would lose this job in a week like, not... <laughs> there's no world in which that imagine that they're, they're they turn to you <laughs> there's no, there's, they're like we need this is the guy that needs to do the <laughs> Oh boy! And if he and if he doesn't, his job is <laughs> interviews. The interview. There's no point in the interview in which that came up. But the second you get in the room and you're the only black guy there, they're like, "Well, <laughs> well, yeah, you yeah. don't have a black man to do these act outs." So, <laughs> another former kid who loved cartoons is Branson Reese, and now he writes and illustrates his own incredibly popular 
comic strip series called Swan Boy. Swan Boy was also briefly an animated series for FX. Here's how animation influenced him. It's like, I'm trying to remember what was, I guess like, like Batman Returns was, ha you know, I'm trying yeah, to think yeah. of like what would have caused that. Or like, I think I just liked Halloween. I think I was like at the right age the first time I had a Halloween. I was yeah. like, oh, this is this is fun. But the big one I remember that I do more consciously remember is uh, cartoons and like old, like like really bombastic sort of screwball, like Looney Tunes, old, like that kind of stuff was the first thing where I was like, oh, this is amazing. And I it was also the first time I remember being like, why doesn't everyone feel this way? What's wrong with you people? Like, this is <laughs> this is as good as it gets. Why do people my age care about anything else? Like, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't this speak <laughs> to something inside? That, so that was like, I guess that was the first time where I was like, OK, this is a preference I have that I'm drawn to that has alienated me from other people in a positive way. Yeah. <laughs> so specifically for like the older Looney Tunes cartoons. And you were saying, yeah, really why is like watching Pokemon. When I mean, even that, I love that stuff, but like this yeah. is like bef pre that I'm trying. This is like um, this would have been early 90s, I guess, when I'm first like forming. I don't I guess it doesn't need to be that like specific. <laughs> of, like, it's sort of in April of 1992. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think that was because they would just play it all the time. You know, I, I was born yeah. in 88. So like, like I think I'm I'm pretty. I'm at a perfect uh, crosshairs of like Who Framed Roger Rabbit was like this yeah. exciting movie that had come out when, like when I was born and it was still around. Same. Yeah. I was born in 89. And oh, it, it is it. like that is such a specific cross section because we were getting like revamped elements of the older Looney Tunes through things yeah. like the Animaniacs that were still great and still had a, like even like the, the animated Batman and Superman had this classic style which seems like impossible to get a studio to commit to commit to now um, i know it's so <laughs> and it's funny because like animaniacs i remember watching is and that really spoke to and i would just like watch it over and over we'd get tapes of it and i'd like wear them out watching it and in yeah. retrospect i remember being like what a sharp cool show you know like this is amazing and I, i've rewatched some of that old stuff and it is uh, my mom deserves a medal of honor that she didn't murder suicide me like it's <laughs> it's so grating <laughs> And it's not bad, but it's like, you know, a woman in her early 30s who's like got enough on her plate. <laughs> like, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. The last thing she just <laughs> wants repeating over and over. To her credit, she never let me know. But it's also weird. Like I was watching so much the Andy Griffith show. When I think of like a, a <laughs> like a sitcom that I loved when I was yeah. a kid, it is the Beverly Hillbillies. Great show. <laughs> and I don't think, you know, we're the last generation or maybe the only generation to have something like that, because that was the sweet spot of television has been around for that exact amount of time. Yeah, because it's yeah. now because that was you were watching that on, I assume, like Nick at Night the way I was right. Like the uh, no, they would play it on like on regular TV somehow. Like I would I would watch. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, the Andy Griffith show. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel Which, like by now the way, if a TV executive played that, that would be their like you f this job i'm out of here like you know because because i've seen like what is in syndication for children now, you know because it's like the the clock keeps moving right so yeah. they're they're watching stuff from 30 years ago now and that's like fresh prince and friends yeah friends they're watching is friends the, yeah is the i dream of genie to us is friends to the kids today but just because you love cartoons doesn't mean you end up making cartoons one of my previous guests on You Are the Genre is literary scholar Mary Rambrin Ohm, who specializes in early medieval England, and on top of that, is a black woman. Well, I think initially, still something that I go to if I'm stressed out is cartoons. I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s, and cartoons were a big part of my life. And um, it wasn't until I was... <laughs> actually in grad school that I realized that, hey, like half of these, you know, cartoons are actually set in the Middle Ages as well. <laughs> like it didn't even occur to me, like the Smurfs and gummy bears. and Oh, wow. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. The Smurfs <laughs> make sense. But did you say gummy bears? Yeah. The gummy bears is set in. Yeah. I do not remember a gummy bears cartoon. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. They were you're telling me there was a cartoon about medieval gummy bears? <laughs> it was a 
They they had like gummy berry juice and they would drink this, you know, s- super juice or whatever, and it would make them bounce. That was like their, their thing. I, I don't, even, <laughs> I don't even remember like this. Some, I was too young, I think when, when it was on initially. So it's mostly reruns and, you know, they had like the medieval garb on and there was a, you know, a magician and a cook and a like all of these, you know, from the guilds. <laughs> yeah. But whatever the, I don't even know who the bad guy was, but however they got away from him was with that gummy berry juice, I think. So <laughs> I am definitely falling down. <laughs> uh, speaking of Wikipedia, a Wikipedia rabbit hole, learning everything I possibly can. <laughs> About this cartoon. I was also a reader as a child, so spent a lot of time in books because growing up, I didn't have a a whole lot of money. And so my dad used to buy me encyclopedias. We had an old copy of The Hobbit and um, yeah, ended up reading all of the Lord of the Rings. And um, I think very early on to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is another one that, that stuck with me. And more recently, I learned that Charlie was supposed to be black. Oh, wow. Yeah. I feel like I remember yeah. hearing that. So, I mean, that would have been wild to, you know, because <laughs> just have, you know, this this depiction of this little black boy who, you know, take down the house with, with the Oompa Loompas, but whatever. They can redo it. <laughs> well, of course, if they redo it, the golden ticket becomes a handout. <laughs> I can already hear the Republican... Uh, <laughs> The Republican spin on the, on the story. Yeah. Um, you know, Ch- Charlie's absent father just reappears yeah. when, he, when he wins the gold ticket. Yeah. Moving on, I couldn't have an episode about animation without highlighting an interview with Grant Lindahl. I met Grant when we were both working at Comedy Central, the digital end of Comedy Central out here in New York. And it was during that time that he developed and created a very popular YouTube series called Tales from the Trip, in which comedians and other celebrities talked about crazy acid trip stories from their life that were then animated. Since then, Grant and I also collaborated on a webcomic series that I wrote called Uncertain Life. I think it'll come back one of these days, but we made 100 issues of that thing that I'm very proud of. And you can, of course, check those out at uncertainlifecomic.com or over at my Substack, which you can find a link to at youarethegenre.com. How did he carve out this path as an animator? He explains it here in this clip. My friends were always getting in trouble. Like, there's always a lot of bad stuff. And so I had an art teacher. I was, like, walking the hallway one day, and this kid who was on the track team with me, he was like, Hey, this teacher wants you to talk to you, the art teacher. Uh, I was like, oh, weird. I've never spoken to her. And I didn't take art in, in school. I took it in middle school. But in high school, a kid got stabbed in my, my intro art class with a pair of scissors, in like right class. in like the clavicle. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and so then I was like, yeah, because all the bad kids took art. <laughs> and so like you, you could take an elective and so it costs money to do any of the instrument classes. So it was like less bad kids, like there were bad kids, but like you're not going to yeah. get stabbed with a scissors. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, fuck this. I'm not going to be in the art class. Also, my art teacher was really into like Native American stuff and like First Nation stuff. And I thought it was inappropriate for okay. a white lady to and be that- like way yeah yeah and it was really weird of like how she would talk about indigenous people and just like fetishized it in a weird way and i was just like yeah this is a weird vibe there's kids getting stabbed (laughs) this lady's talking about the mysticism of like the nez pierce people and i was just like yeah i got i gotta get out here (laughs) this is weird vibes um and so a different art teacher and my senior year uh, so I hadn't taken art since like freshman year that, and I had like gotten out of that class. Uh, but I was always making art. I was always drawing, doing like all this kind of art all the time, but it was just really just a part of my existence, you know, filling up tons and tons of notebooks and sketchbooks. I still have them to this day. I have like 50 of them. And she's like, I need you to take advanced placement art. Like it's like a college credit art class. Otherwise I can't keep my job. It's because she needed to like, they're doing budget cuts or something. She was like a family friend and she went to our church and I was like, fine, I'll do it. Yeah, sure. Okay. 
just to help her out. And like, I didn't even take it seriously. And so when you take that class, you have to pick a project that you're going to do for that class. It's not like different assignments. You pick an art piece that you're going to do, and then you're going to show it at the end of the year and get a grade. And, you know, I thought that would be an easy credit and it would literally just be two people in the class. So you just went into this art studio and kind of drew and doodled or did whatever you want. But all of a sudden, when I took that class, she was really effing cool and was like, her dad was like a big advertising guy and did a bunch of ad campaigns. And she was just like really encouraging. And I came up with this concept of doing like a where's Waldo kind of triptych of 12 pieces of 18 by 24 kind of cutaways. So you could see uh, it was New York city and it was different parts of New York that all connected these 12 giant pieces of art. And they were super busy, heavily illustrated, And you could see the underground. So you could see what was happening above ground in the city. And then you could see like, you know, a different setting. So like it'd be Wall Street, but then you could see like a crazy setting and it would be hyper detailed. It was like super, super detailed. So like the first day I made this map and I wrote down like, uh, it's like how you do like a story tree. Mm. And, And I just made this huge connected map of like themes And it just sparked something in my brain. And I was like, oh, man, this is how you organize a creative idea. And like I started planning out the process and, you know, other teachers got involved. Like one teacher gave me like a light table so I could I would sketch it out and then I would trace it in ink on this light table and then I'd watercolor it. And these, you know, it take a month to do one. I started getting faster with it. So I was doing that. And then somebody from the the Maryland Institute College of Art, uh, Micah, this is this art school in Baltimore, uh, came and saw it. And she was like, you should come to our portfolio day. And I had just visited this one college. It was like for ups that like don't have good (laughs) grades. And like, and it literally, the college looked like my hometown. It seemed like my hometown. I effing hate my hometown. And so I was like, it was like conservative mountain town. And, And in like, you know, Western Maryland, West Virginia. I was like, oh, I don't want to go there. Uh, It probably would have been fine. Well, when the lady came up to me and she was like, oh, you should, I'd be like, yeah, right, lady. Like, I'm going to (laughs) go to an art portfolio day. I'm not an (laughs) asshole. And so, because I was like, artists are idiots. (laughs) And like, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of this town. And also, like, I've been told my whole life that my art is bad. And like, my parents don't like it. (laughs) <laughs> like it's not, you know, it's cartoons. They don't like that. Um, they, my parents really only love like self portraits that are done, look like photographs and like oh, Georgia wow. so O'Keeffe. They probably love AI art now then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so does every client of mine. And I'm like, Oh, oh God, yeah. What am I going to do now? <laughs> well, yeah. Quickly. How, how are you feeling about that right now? I hate it. it sucks. Yeah. yeah. yeah they're They lie to your teeth and they're like, oh, it's just going to be a tool you can use. (laughs) And then they they don't finish the sentence because what they're really saying in their head is it's just a tool you can use to replace you. (laughs) And everything is like that right now, too. Like a lot of, uh, you know, copywriting gigs and things. If you look at the descriptions, they're basically like some of them are outright saying this is a job to train AI how to do this. And when the AI art became a thing. It was crazy. Like I immediately saw how I would have a direct choice in my own life of like, if I'm going to pitch a sci-fi movie, I could pay a human being to make some concept art, or I could type some keywords into (laughs) into AI to get something that's passable enough to put on a presentation. And that's crazy. Like it's, 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 it's just insane how quickly we've gotten to this, to this point. And that thing is only going to escalate month by month until we're in a totally different concept of like what basic (laughs) jobs are. And I think it's scary because we all thought that the arts were the cutoff point of where technology could interrupt jobs. But now it's like AI is going to take away Uber drivers jobs. It's going to take away. (laughs) It's going to take all our jobs. And then we're just going to have to. I mean, I thought, you know, I always thought I was like, oh, well, I can always like make like Pokemon cards like Pokemon (laughs) is a fictional economy, but it's huge. And but now AI has cratered that. (laughs) You're like, oh, God, damn. Um, 
that Skynet has definitely come for us in the form yeah. of chat GPT. But like I've had clients now, I used to have clients make me like mood boards on Pinterest of like what they want. Cause nobody knows what they want, but I'm, I'm trying to like get a vibe. Yeah. Now they use AI art and they're like, can you make this? Can you make this exact thing? And I'm like, ah, oh, that's depressing. Like yeah. I hate, I, I don't want to copy <laughs> robots copied art. Like, uh, just use that. Leave me alone. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know, man. Like you just, you just, I don't want to end up like all of my art professors who like never adapted to like digital production and like animation and like yeah. art and just like kept using the tools in the old ways. And, and I'm like, well, you know, maybe now with this, I can figure out, I don't know. I guess I'll just become a slam poet and live under a bridge. I don't <laughs> fucking know. Like, I mean, it, it, when you're an artist, you don't love it. It's fucking miserable. But yeah, yeah. like, you know, you're always going to be doing it. Like, it, it's just like, it's like being a heroin addict or something. Like, you can't really quit. Like, it's yeah. always going to, there's always going to be some kind of methadone or some shit to it. You know, it's a very thankless, selfish, stupid thing to do, but you just do it because that's who you are. You know, that's yeah. being an artist. I love tracking how everyone's trying to adapt to this because even like down to stand up comedy, so much of that has changed in terms of clips and like, you know, it's crazy at Comedy Central, you know, it was someone's job to to put captions on a video. Yeah. Ethan. Technology has taken that job, <laughs> taken that job away. When I first got to New York, I didn't have a job yet. And so I was doing I was transcribing audio. And so much of that technology has taken away like the need for a human being. You know, now they maybe just need to do a couple spell checks and grammar checks on what uh, an algorithm spit out of a transcript. So, Dude, I used to like Photoshop for like a onion type website. And I just did like 12 images a day photoshopping like stupid like for like <laughs> fake sports scenes. That job would not have existed now. Like like <laughs> they'd just use chat GPT and be like, you know, show me I don't know, Michael Jordan eating cheesecake. And yeah. I used to have to Photoshop that and it would look good. But like now that's gone. And that's yeah. it's wild. I mean, it was a crappy job, but, you know, it was kind of my first break into the game, you know. But, yeah, it's 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 a trip, man. And it's it's a I feel like the it's a dark future, but also everything's a dark future so i don't care like f it let's go into this dark blade runner beyond i'm excited <laughs> i feel like a key to it all though is um let me know if you identify with this as well but instead of specifically chasing the ever evolving algorithms i think the most important thing is to just focus on the genuine thing that you want to do because that has the most sustainable validation that you could ask <laughs> that you could ask for and, and of course it is important to understand you know what makes a certain type of project work well on instagram versus facebook versus tv versus youtube or whatever but that becomes too daunting at some point i feel like when we were at comedy central you created something called tales from the trip which was a huge hit and i feel like you must feel amazing about that but i know that there are also some frustrations that came along with it describe the show for people who haven't heard of it and then just tell me you know what your feelings are about that now oh yeah um i mean it so it's called tales from the trip and it was you know like in the vein of like tales from the tour bus or like any kind of like that vice had like party stories that were like animated and so like i knew these guys at the creek in the cave in Long Island City that were doing this show where they would take psychedelics and then they would tell like a story while on psychedelics. And then they would have me take psychedelics and then draw while they're telling this story. <laughs> and so we'd all just lose our minds on mushrooms at like midnight in Queens. It was the best. It was awesome. So I pitched this idea to Comedy Central because I, I don't know. I just was like over editing like McDonald's sponsored Twitter talk shows. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, let's do I want to do something. Here we go, man. You know, <laughs> I'm shameless about trying to get things through because like, why not? I'm not yeah. your friend. Let's do it. <laughs> I don't care if I've 
like, I'm not offending anybody, but I'm going to be bold, like just reach out to people. And so I was like, Hey, I, I made this concept, you know, I want to interview this comedian, Shane Moss. And then I want to animate his like psychedelic stories. Cause I thought animation could really lend to it. Cause he had this one story about DMT that went viral on YouTube that a ex-girlfriend of mine showed me like a couple years before. And I was like, Oh man, this is hot. This, this could be really good. You know, what's something that you can't put on TV. You can't put on streaming that, well, you couldn't put on streaming until they did. So, so I, we, we filmed uh, Shane and then I animated it all on my own and yeah. And I think they didn't even want to put it. They said no that originally to put it on YouTube. And I told our boss that I was like, just fire me, just put it on. <laughs> and if I in trouble, I hate it here. I want to leave. Cause like, I just felt like such a weirdo there and just like, I was over it. And, and then it blew up and cause I knew that there was a demand for it. And cause of, cause of like Reddit and people love Shane And then they were like, can you do like six more? So like when any studio or any company says no to you, like they don't know what they're talking about, (laughs) you know, just do it. And I don't know, take some risks, apologize after, you know, because like companies are afraid to do anything like cool. (laughs) And so, (laughs) so then, um, yeah, it was six episodes. And then I just started figuring out that if you do stuff really cheaply and quickly, and it has a certain genre base, you can kind of really grow it out without a ton of hands in the pot. And so it was really just me for a while. And then I was able to add people. And then I also really hustled. So like I booked all the talent. So like I would DM people. And since I had the Comedy Central brand behind me, a lot of people would get back to me. So I DM people on Instagram, like celebrities, like all the time. Yeah. And, and, you know, like Patton Oswalt said no, but he was really nice. And like, (laughs) you know, a lot of rappers like are always down because I don't give a fuck. Uh, Musicians don't care about their brand too much because they're, (laughs) it makes them look cool, you know, talking about drugs. Um, and, and yeah, and people really got into it because it, it really lended to the animation had a purpose. Like, I feel like there are so many shows out there now where it's like it's animated, but doesn't need to be. And they don't really utilize animation's potential. And I think when you're going to make an animated show, you need to figure out why or or like even or like how you can like. Yeah, like Big Mouth has like kids talking about sex and like ghost creatures and stuff. So like I guess that kind of makes sense why that needs to be animated. But like I don't know. There's like shows like Bob's Burgers that doesn't need to be animated, but they do it because it's easier to I don't know why. Like I just don't <laughs> understand. Like I guess they're well, copying the but, Simpsons. Or... I'm also fascinated by by specifically like King of the Hill, which I feel is the ultimate show that doesn't need to be animated, but works. I I just think it was a point of time because like there's no way anybody could get that made. I I don't know. Like you see other stuff on Netflix, but like King of the Hill looks really good. And then you see the now the new model where everything's kind of like puppeted or looks super clean. And it doesn't really have that traditional animation that I think we've really lost. And I just feel like it doesn't look as good. It just feels even the writing feels like everything feels like it's made by AI, too. (laughs) Like, I don't know. It's just when everybody's all worried about AI, I'm like, have you seen a Marvel movie? Like, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, that's like the biggest thing. It feels like when you think about like how much plastic surgery people do or how all the digital filters that people put over their own videos, it's like AI is becoming us and we are becoming AI at the same time. Like it's not, no one's really trying to diverge from it. We're all just trying to become the one same consciousness, thing. Yeah. one, yeah, one like, entity. Yeah. The, the hive mind <laughs> yeah. kill the individuals. <laughs> well, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but, um, I do want to kind of pivot to the last question, which is, what is your relationship to the first craft? So the first craft that you wanted to pursue was acting. Having gone through everything that you've done now, having really taken this, maybe hobby is the wrong word, but this thing that you love doing just naturally, art, and taking that 
all the way into the point now where that's your career. When you think back on the version of yourself that wanted to be on stage and wanted to act, how do you feel about that person? How do you feel about that pursuit? Oh, man, I don't think it will ever go away. I always want to do it. It just makes me sad all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Auditioning makes me sad. Like failing makes me sad. Like it just makes you feel sweaty. But I don't think it will ever go away. It's fun. But like, I think the older I get, the less I care about it. Like, you know, I, I think I would get jealous or be like, you know, oh, why can't I just like if I or like I'll make excuses and be like, well, if I had a rich dad or like, you know, like if I if I didn't have all this art school debt, I'd be able to do that. But now that I'm like older, I think I've made a pretty good path. Like I make little videos and I'm still in stuff. And if the opportunity presented itself to do something, you know, and that I'd, I'd definitely do it. But I think having my practice and and doing animation and drawing and it just really centers me and it makes me feel it makes me feel good to like at least I'm kind of in that world I mean being an artist is just such a bummer too because like like especially in LA like everybody steals your ideas like all your stuff is like commodified in that way and like nobody remembers you you want to like i make art because i'm terrified at the core of it at at, like the true core of creation i want to live on after i die because i am so scared i don't believe in the afterlife i just Mm. believe that you're just gone and like it's like turning the lights off and i just want to live as an impacted memory for the next generations, you know, because I was just so isolated and sad as a kid. And so my art is maybe to make it a little bit better for society in a selfish way for the next, (laughs) you know, uh, reincarnation of what a mentally ill weirdo I am that has to like go live on a farm. Like maybe it will be better because I made a cartoon that teaches people to not ban drugs. I don't know. Like, but like, you're just trying to exist and change because like, that's what art is. It's trying to communicate your philosophy. And when your philosophy is not with the main paradigm, you create content and work to hopefully shift it in that way. And that's what an artist is, is you're just a very tiny paradigm shifter. And, And so in the relation to being like an actor wanting that I think the art will live on longer and and that's kind of the pursuit one of my dear friends Ian Abramson who I met in high school has been deeply impacted by a cartoon known only as the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles here's why I remember I think it was kindergarten or first grade. My answer to what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, <laughs> like the idea of just being one thing never uh, occurred to me, but it was, uh, it was like, I want to be a cartoonist. Oh. I want to be an Olympian swimmer <laughs> and I want to be a trash man. Those are the three things. That's how that's, you know, trash man will probably pay the bills. Uh cartoonist will be my passion and then swimming will probably be i didn't have these words as at this age (laughs) well it is interesting that is like a trinity of things to consider in your life like the practical reasonable garbage man Mm -hmm. fitness is important in your life and then balancing that with the with your (laughs) with your passion (laughs) as as a cartoonist yeah would you say that of those three things somehow the cartoon element is what you officially pursued as a craft or how much of it was uh, the garbage and the, and the swimming. The significance of the garbage was that it was a normal job. And also it was kind of weird, even back then. <laughs> like I kind of just like wanted to kind of like have the weird guy vibe. I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't really think about it or talk about it in that way, but I remember specifically being like, dude the garbage man drives this big truck that has like these weird (laughs) robot arms yeah and everyone knows they make good money somehow everyone that's the first thing anyone says (laughs) anytime 
you know, garbage men, they make good money. <laughs> uh, like, But how many people know a garbage man? That's the other thing. It feels I like don't think I've ever club. met. Yeah. I don't think I've ever met someone that is specifically that job once. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. And I, the reason I know that is because I know I would have asked questions that I don't have answers to. Yeah. I guess you know? uh, saying as we talk about this, I'm realizing that the proper term is sanitation worker, I assume. It is not just back weird then. that that not back back then, when, like, when I was in kindergarten. But, uh, but there is something badass about owning the term garbage man. Right? I'm a garbage man. A garbage man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But it, it also feel it feels connected to the Ninja Turtles in the way because the Ninja Turtles kind Absolutely. of uh, live in filth, uh, gloriously live. <laughs> right, they're constantly yeah. upcycling their freegans. <laughs> yeah, I I love it. So there's so there's that swimming. I was on a swim team, and so like that was like the the sport that I liked at that point. You could compare swimming to stand up in that there's there's definitely a competitive vibe, but also at the end of the day, it's you're solely competing with your yourself you know like yeah. if two people go up on a show and if two people are racing in the water they're not bumping into each other they're not affecting each other right they're just both yeah. going as fast as they possibly can yeah it feels like stand-up is both a, a swim what do you call it a swim race a swim mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. swim swim race mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> swim race stand -up is, both a swim is that race. what people mean when they say the race car okay <laughs> I, or yeah, so sorry. What? Oh, oh yeah, stand up feels like it's both a swim race and a pool party. You know, it's balancing yes, those it two does. vibes. So, like you have to be able to to float uh, <laughs> between, between use your floaty and go between social circles. You know, get to the deep end comfortably, and uh, for sure, then be able to be able to, to race. Yeah, for sure. I do rem I had a deep passion though for being a cartoonist. I will say that. I did like I in my very soul I wanted to do that. I was drawing constantly. I remember making up characters. You and I related over this. I like would be trying to map out a little cartoon world, right? Or oh. like uh these are the characters that I keep drawing over and over again so that I can get better at them. And it's like these kids, come on. <laughs> my relationship with drawing, that's what I thought creativity was. Yeah, it makes sense. Even in high school, you were, I feel like it was, it was consistently like ensemble characters I have this specific memory of a character of a, like a superhero you created who, who, uh, um, sweats, uh, um, <laughs> gasoline of some sort and lights it on fire i thought it was really cool i still think it's really cool i listen uh, i think about that guy sometimes i can't lie to you, you i can't be, lie to you I've never, I think about I've never it. seen anything like it he's a great character this Someone is who, so like who so these gasoline these, yeah flammable liquid you know? so he could spit and light it on fire yeah he could pee <laughs> if he ran a mile he could you know like i uh, yeah it was it was fun it was uh it was like a combination that that was like it was like X Men and Sin City. That was mm. the vibe. It was like combining those things, and I somehow didn't realize that's what I was doing. You know? <laughs> yeah. You also really loved Mystery Team. Are you talking about Mystery Team or Mystery Men? I love them both. Oh wait, wait, Mystery Men, Mystery Men, yes. and then later mis Mystery Team. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I knew. Yeah, it was like <laughs> we're ju we're jumping ahead to Mystery <laughs> Team. That's a different foundational piece of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it feels like the DNA of the Ninja Turtles is still in oh, there. For sure. You love for a sure. ragtag group of people coming together. So much. These days, it's heists. I'm all about heists, and it's the same thing. Friends getting together <laughs> to pull something off. Oh, I love it. Lastly, I'd like to highlight a part of my conversation with Family Guy writer Evan Waite. He's got a really funny book out called Life Once You Dead, and I was fascinated both by the fact that he is someone who has a thriving career as a comedy writer and yet has never performed comedy live, or at least not often. I'm amazed by anyone who's carved a path in that way because I'm one of those guys who, you know, doing stand-up was a part of my path towards getting writing jobs. But at the same time, we connected on our mutual introverted ways. And since his book, Life Once You Dead, incorporates illustrations in such a lovely way, I wasn't surprised to learn that things like comic books and illustrations called out to him in his youth. Uh, well, I mean, ironically, I think Calvin and Hobbes is really like, that would be my first 
thing that I really locked into. I was like, this is like the best thing I've ever seen. Um, I remember my grandfather, he had a, a copy of one of the treasuries and he just sort of gave it to me and I didn't really know what it was. And I just got like obsessed with it right away. It's like, it's so childlike, but it's also super smart and interesting. The pictures are like fun to look at. Like every element of it is like firing on all cylinders. Do you identify with Calvin or Hobbes? <laughs> well, I mean, I did, I did sort of grow up in like a rural situation. So I was sort of like lived in the woods. Uh -huh. And so there's a lot of that stuff in the comic where they're just kind of traipsing through the woods. And, you know, that was sort of like what I was doing, too. So I definitely related to that. Well, that's so interesting, too, because that is like it's a mixture of writing, but also illustration. And so now now you're kind of yep. full circle, like back to exactly that, especially with this book. A lot of illustrations. Who did the illustrations, by the way? Uh, it's this woman I met named Paula Searing. When I was working on the proposal, I was like, I wanted to make sure that it had graphic elements in the proposal, as opposed to like describing what they would be if, I, if it was a book. So I reached out to uh, my friend Steve, who was running ClickHole at the time. And I just asked him if he knew any good illustrators or people who would be able to like do a lot of different kind of visual stuff, but also make sure that they really understand what the joke is. And they recommended Paula to me. And it was just like, that was like the single best decision that I made in the entire thing. She was like perfect for it. Super organized, could do anything. So then it sort of expanded my sort of writing because I realized like anything I can come up with, she can like execute. So she was like a major part of why the book came out the way it did. Did a lot of your animation writing chops come in handy for a book like this? Because I am curious as to like, how much do you add after you see the visuals? Do you kind of punch up and like add, add things based off of that? <laughs> And how, how often is that even the case in animation writing? Like, is there a point after the animation comes in where there's any space to add something else? I suppose that's when they're doing the, the voice acting, maybe. Yeah, I mean, there definitely are several stages of like the animated process where you can redo or just like sort of tweak things. Basically, like the farther along it gets in the process, the harder it gets to make changes. Yeah. So the changes have to be smaller, like if it's like, you know, in the color stage. But in the early stage, which is called an animatic, which is like a black and white rendering of the episode where it's like a little, not all the frames are in it and it's like more rough, but you can sort of just see what it looks like and if it is working or not. At that point, you can make larger changes. But, you know, for a show like Family Guy, where there is a, like a long lead time, I think it's about 15 months from the time an episode starts to like when it airs. Wow. So, yeah. And that's one of the luxuries of animation. You really have a lot of chances to, to fix your mistakes. Yeah, but that is very intense compared to basically every other style of writing where it's like, yeah, I'm having so much fun writing this. You have no idea where your life is going to be 15 months later when you're actually yeah. seeing it on TV. <laughs> you really like forget about it, too. You see it and like, oh, yeah, I remember that joke. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a distant memory. <laughs> uh, when you were a kid, was it normal among your friend group to be one of the the peers reading Calvin and Hobbes? I don't know. I mean, I don't remember any. I mean, I'm sure lots of people were reading it like independently, but we were like getting together and like pouring over the books like <laughs> side by side. So I'm not sure what they were up to. <laughs> and, and what part of it do you think, or do you think a part of it kind of defines an element of your humor? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's like a playfulness in it that is really appealing you know it's just like sort of it's fun and it's not like it has like serious moments but it also just has a playfulness and like an imagination that's really attractive to a child i feel like you kind of answered this but maybe not but uh, the second question to ask in the show is what was the first official craft that you pursued how long had comedy writing been something that you aspired to and if that wasn't always the case what was the first thing that you were like you know, not what your first job was, but what was the first craft that you're like, this is what I'm going to attempt doing with my life? When I was in college, me and a friend that I met, you know, my freshman year, we started doing like little cartoons for the newspaper. And, um, you know, that was just really fun. I mean, I would write stuff and then he, I would slide it over to him and he would draw it. And it was very rudimentary and rough, but like it was fun. And so that I think was the first thing that wet my palate for like comedy writing. And it was like a different style of it. And I remember in high school, like my, I found some old papers when I went back to my parents' house and I had forgotten that I'd even done this, but I used to like have comic strips to, like, cut out of the newspaper and then you would like erase the dialogue. Oh, really? That they had written and then you just like write your own stuff in there. And yeah. So it was, a lot of it was very crass. I was just like, <laughs> 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 but, uh, but it was like, 
sort of uh, looking back, I'm like, okay, I can start, start to trace how something. Yeah. How, how could you even forget that? It feels so know. clear. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was like, oh, right. I, really <laughs> I had a lot of time on my hands. I was just waiting <laughs> So that was always the, the, the specific craft because you were a teacher for a while. That was just you living a very practical life saying like, this is, this is what life is going to be. Yeah. Uh, all that other stuff never occurred to me that that could be like a career of any kind. It's just like, oh, this is fun stuff. But like now I've just graduated from college. It's time to like get serious and do the job thing. Yeah. Like put that, put that stuff away, you know, and I did for a while. And then all of a sudden it just sort of, uh, there was a moment when it sort of came back and I was like, I should probably do this and try. Well, what was that moment? What was happening with you emotionally at that time that was like, I need a shift here. I need to actually pursue this thing. Well, I think being in China, like you start to see people that have been there a long time like expats and they're just sort of a little warped in a way they're just like <laughs> there's like oh now you can't come back to america because like you're so you know it's just like you're so off and not that everybody who does that is but like it definitely i started to see what my future would look like and i was like i'm not sure if that's what i want to do and so it started to make me like refocus on like like what do i actually want to do and it just sort of rekindled that aspect of it and and it sort of came back with a vengeance, actually. I was like, oh, that would be fun. And then all of a sudden, I'm like obsessed with it. And I was just like writing onion stuff constantly. Like every day after work, I would just be writing it for hours. And, you know, so like by the time I had any opportunity to do anything, I had like 100 pages of like headlines. And I was just like pouring all my energy into it. And, and so I started to realize like this is what I should be doing. How long were you there? I'm curious about what that distance from America how that affects your humor, how that does that give you a sort of bird's eye view on things that helps with the comedy? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I was there for five years, oh. uh, five school years. Um, and, you know, I would come back to America over the holiday, like over the summer break and stuff. But it definitely like shifts your perspective. And I think that's sort of what comedy is all about is like seeing things in a different way than like the usual way. And so I definitely think being plopped in a completely different culture and seeing things through different eyes and seeing things that you took for granted in America that are done completely differently in China. Like I can't help but sharpen that sort of perspective and, and uh, perception. Of it. The people in your life, how did they feel when you made that decision? It was weird. Like it would be almost a Rorschach test of the other person. It'd be like where my mom was like, yeah, that sounds great. You should just do that. If that's what you want to do, go for it. She also encouraged me to go to China if I go, if I wanted to, or, you know, she's just like, do what you want. Nice. My dad's like a little more cautious. He's just like, okay, I don't know. All right, <laughs> sure. You know, he's not like actively saying not to do it, but like, yeah, yeah. He's the kind of guy where like he gets very panicked about stuff, which I guess ties into the fear thing. Yeah. Um, where like when I went to China, he was like, I don't know. I saw a story of like a train crash there once. And I was like, okay, <laughs> it's a pretty big country. And just because a bad thing happened there once, it's like off the list. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the way to pursue it <laughs> were there little versions of that conversation throughout your life um i don't know i think that you know as they get older i think the fear sends to take hold more than like yeah they, the more law and order they start watching the more <laughs> right yeah it's just like and i i also have to think that that has to do with like the cable news the rise of that it's just like we're just like more aware of problems than we used to be. It's funny you, you describing your childhood. I'm imagining Craig of the Creek. Have you watched that show, that cartoon? No. I'm it's this heard. great um, uh, cartoon, a little black kid who hangs out in the wilderness a lot. And I feel like that's not, I mean, that's so different from my childhood. I grew up in South Central LA and I was a very indoors kid because I wasn't allowed to go around the block. There is a lot of creative freedom, it seems like you get by being able to explore like that. Yeah, it's just nobody's really watching. They're just like, just come back later. <laughs> and uh, so, and also, you know, like social media wasn't as big of a thing. So you're just doing, you know, you're just bored and you're just trying to have fun. And, you know, yeah. I have friends over and we're just making up games and stuff. I mean, just games that like kids should not be doing, just like super violent and just <laughs> like somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> We used to play this game where uh, there, like, we had this motion detector on the driveway, and like, so you'd walk down the driveway. But if if you walk slowly enough, then the motion detector won't go off. So then it would be a game where like one person would have to walk from one end of the driveway to the other side, and 
everybody had like rocks and sticks and they were all like, like as soon as the light goes on, then we get to throw stuff at you and just try to like pelt you with everything we can find. <laughs> so it was so tense because you'd be walking so slowly. But then the second the light goes on, you have to like bolt because everybody's tossing shit at you. I'm like, why are they letting us do this? Like this is, <laughs> they're just throwing rocks at each other. Like that's not a good thing to be doing. But, uh, you know, just like a million versions of that kind of stuff. So it's just, you know, and my friends were very creative and it was just like a fun kind of a thing. So thank you again for listening to this best of episode of You Are the Genre. You can find full conversations with all of these guests over at youarethegenre.com. And you can also subscribe to the newsletter associated with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for supporting this show. And I'll see you soon with a couple more best of episodes and then classic full conversation episodes with a new roster of guests. This is Tim Barnes signing off with your reminder that you are the genre. First I got your voicemail, then I got you. But we can meet in person or maybe on Zoom. So tell me what's your genre, tell me what do you do? I'd like to know the things that specifically make